Well, it's a pleasure to be here on, uh, on the occasion of Doron's birthday. Um, it certainly brings back uh, memories. Uh, the first time I uh, moved to the States, uh, Doron was actually one of the people welcoming me there. Uh, we were both postdocs at Princeton. Uh, and um, uh, that year was actually a bit of a, a quiet year at the department, various people were on leave. So we were each other's sort of yeah, uh, neighbors. Uh, and I remember a uh, very uh, yeah, distinct um, good uh, occasions. Uh, one time uh, at the dinner with Ida and uh, Doran invited us over. That was a lovely evening. Uh, and uh, also um, we went together to a, a conference in, uh, in Texas, strings, a strings meeting. Uh, and there was a, an afternoon off, uh, and Doran and I decided to drive off uh, into the Texas. Uh, yeah, where do you go in Texas? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we went to a lake, uh, and I remember the conversations, uh, which mostly were about uh, our culture shock uh, at the United States, we thought was a, a weird country. And uh, here we are in this year, and things haven't changed uh, much. Um, now, uh, other memories of Doran, of course, are uh, his uh, very influential uh, work, uh, in, in which I was uh, very motivated by when during my graduate study. Um, and I think uh, Kostas gave a very beautiful uh, description of how uh, Doran's work really opened our eyes to how uh, geometry and conformal field theory uh, were intimately connected, and how conformal field theory was actually a language for uh, extracting geometry. And uh, another uh, insight that Dorn had was really that for supersymmetry and string theory, in those days, obviously, the string world sheet was an important motivation for doing conformal field theory. It uh, had to do with um, uh, the fact that uh, one should be able to uh, uh, disentangle the left and the right movers of two-dimensional CFTs. Uh, and indeed, in my uh, early work, on, uh, on string perturbation theory, uh, uh, partly because we were motivated of proving uh, the supersymmetry word identities, this decomposition into left and right movers was also a theme in our work. And the connection indeed with modular invariance, which also Doran sort of, uh, I, I learned from his papers. Uh, so this is actually from a paper with uh, uh, Robert uh, Dachraff and, and my brother, Eric. Um, where we uh, recognize some, some interesting structure once you start looking at the uh, independent left and right mo moving sectors of a two-dimensional CFT. Uh, and this was just for a free scalar field, uh, where it turns out that one could define, is there a pointer that I can use here? Is which button should I push? Let's try. Is that a light? No. Is there a point? Is there? I'm afraid to push all kinds of things that make, <laughs> make the thing move in directions that I don't want it to move. Okay, I'll just use my height. Uh, it doesn't work. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, that works. Uh, so these are uh, looped integrations uh, of the derivative of the scalar field around these various cycles. And we noted that if you would take uh, what we now call a conformal block, um, uh, that you could define uh, what we call loop momenta as eigenstates of that contour integral around the A cycle. But then if you did that, then the contour integral of that same quantity around the B cycle was actually differentiating respect to the momentum in the other direction. Uh, so indeed, in this paper, we mentioned uh, that uh, the modular transformations which interchange the A and the B cycles are actually canonical transformations. Uh, so this connects with uh, a theme that was also earlier in, uh, in one of the talks, that conformal blocks are actually naturally wave functions of a, of a quantum mechanical space. So this paper was a year before uh, Witten wrote his paper about John Simon's theory, uh, where he actually made this very precise, uh, at least for this class of theories. In this case, the corresponding theory for which these things are wave functions is U1 John Simon's theory, and one can generalize it at that point to uh, theories with current algebra symmetry uh, and which indeed uh, uh, Doran and Witten uh, wrote a famous paper about. Um, and, um, but in that case, the corresponding theory is a non-abelian Chansamis theory in two uh, plus one dimensions. 
Now I became uh, at that point interested in trying to generalize these kind of ideas to non-rational theories uh, and basically I just wanted to do uh, I think in, in the same year as, as I arrived in Princeton at the time uh, about how to generalize these ideas for uh, systems that only had Virasoro symmetry and not the current algebra symmetry. So in that case, uh, of course, one could look at the minimal models, but uh, uh, one could also look at theories that have a larger central charge, uh, and nonetheless, where the conformal blocks are organized just according to uh, what will be the word identity of the Virasoro symmetry. Uh, another important uh, property, indeed, of, uh, of these conformal blocks and it is, is, the, is the fusion matrix, the fact that the formal blocks are multi-valued if you move around uh, in, the, uh, here, in the space of cross ratios. There's this fusion matrix that uh, gives you the, the crossing transformation and that also appeared in an earlier talk. And the, the key point is that uh, this matrix F, uh, once you go to the interpretation uh, of a conformal block as a wave function, it becomes quite natural actually um, to, to go to a slightly different normalization that people usually uh, use. Normally people separate out the uh, operator product coefficients from the definition of a conformal block but if you absorb the operator product coefficients of a conformal field theory in the conformal block uh, then the crossing symmetry relation basically tells you that the, the four-point function which can now be written like so which is just the absolute value of the absolute, the sum of absolute value squares of the conformal block should be equal to this sum where you have uh, yeah, switched the channel. And uh, the idea is that uh, this now looks like a unitary transformation uh, and could it perhaps be true that the unitary transformation that preserves this norm which is this uh, matrix F can also be interpreted as, as basically as a canonical transformation. Could there be operators that say measure this quantum number A uh, and dual operators that measure that quantum number B and then this F is the corresponding canonical transformation. So that was the question I was asking uh, and it's kind of clear what, what the type of geometry is that one has to uh, introduce uh, because the, the key equation uh, that uh, defines a component block is essentially the Vera's oral word identity, you put in the stress entity tensor uh, in the conformal block and we know how it uh, can be pulled out of the correlation function in terms of this operator here. And uh, so a natural guess at the time was that there's some uh, symplectic manifold associated with it and just by, by fiddling around a little bit it became clear that indeed the corresponding uh, equation actually, uh, this corresponding hyperbolic geometry is obtained by taking this stress energy uh, tensor uh, and initially look at its expectation value uh, as something that defines a, a constant curvature metric actually. You can write this thing uh, in, in a Liouville uh, parameterization and then the Liouville equation identifies certain geometries uh, which whose uh, yeah, shape is determined by uh, the residue of these poles. But in the actual conformal uh, word identity, these numbers CIs, which here I'm assuming are just uh, classical quantities, actually become derivatives with respect to Z. Um, and therefore, indeed, um, the suggestion would be that there should be some canonical uh, commutation relation between this, the C and, and the Z variable. Uh, and uh, so if you make that replacement, this turns into uh, the Virasoro uh, operator in the uh, form of the word identity. And, uh, and indeed, the basic geometry here is indeed that of uh, the space of constant curvature metrics. Uh, and indeed, if you quantize the space of constant curvature metrics, which is the same as quantizing Teichmüller space, uh, the suggestion that I made at the time was that these are the Virasoro conformal blocks. And um, Later work uh, indeed by um, many people, uh, Samologikov, uh, Dorn, Otto, uh, Teschner, many other people actually. I, I, I'm not um, able to mention anyone who contributed to this. Uh, it became clear that there's indeed uh, a, a nice geometric structure uh, 
associated with the space of conformal blocks of uh, CFTs with Virasoro symmetry. Um, and that structure in the end, and it boils down to the following type of equations, uh, where you take uh, the CFT uh, and the four point function of it. Um, in general, this thing should be written indeed as a sum of the absolute value squared of, uh, of the chiral conformal blocks. Uh, in such a way that this thing indeed solves the bootstrap equation. But uh, for the case where one is just looking at the space of conformal blocks by itself as an independent Hilbert space um, uh, in its own right, then the corresponding theory turns out to be Liouville theory. Uh, and Liouville theory has a continuum spectrum. So instead of writing a sum, one writes an integral. Uh, and this is natural in the, in the regime where the central charts become very large and also where the conformal dimensions are large, where um, uh, the spectrum of a CFT in general becomes very dense, and this then is sort of a continuum approximation of that discrete spectrum. But let's take this uh, equation literally as it is, and then it turns out that there is a, a, a natural um, yeah, quantum group symmetry, uh, a, a, a symmetry that replaces the Virasoro symmetry uh, in such a way that all the structure of what we call the fusion rules uh, become identi identified between the Virasoro symmetry and this quantum group symmetry. Uh, and then this matrix F that I introduced earlier, this fusion matrix <coughs> actually turns into the 6J symbol because basically what you're doing is you're, you're comparing two ways of taking a tensor product. You either take the tensor product first here and then there and then you take it, uh, compare it with taking these two first and then those two first uh, and in terms of tensor products of representations, the relation between those two ways of doing it is precisely defined as, as what, uh, that's what a 6J symbol is. Uh, and then this unitarity condition uh, that preserves uh, the, uh, you know, the, that solves the bootstrap of this equation, uh, of this uh, correlation function, uh, is then expressed uh, like so. And indeed, this, these uh, symbols indeed satisfy that. So this is work that was done uh, basically 15 years later uh, uh, in the late uh, uh, 1990s and early 2000s, uh, this structure was indeed uh, uh, yeah, uncovered as the structure of the, C of the Virasoro conformal blocks. And um, uh, indeed this uh, relationship with the 6J symbol can be geometrically formulated in a very nice way where essentially you take uh, a tetrahedron uh, because you can glue these things together uh, on the legs with the same uh, label and you get this tetrahedron and this thing indeed uh, can be evaluated uh, and by uh, uh, using um, yeah, uh, more complicated functions known as quantum dialogarithms but if you go to the uh, semi-classical limit the geometric interpretation of these 6J symbols turns into that it's the exp exponent of a, a volume of a tetrahedron in hyperbolic space. Apparently, uh, by the way, Wigner already knew that 6J symbols were um, related to volumes of tetrahedron. Uh, in his case, uh, it was, uh, I think, in, in, in positively curved space, but in this case, it's hyperbolic. Now, let me completely switch gears at this point. Uh, so this was sort of the, the part of the story of, of this 2D CFT and um, at the time I was uh, noticing already a little bit of a similarity between the structure that came out here, these canonical transformations uh, and a structure that my advisor um, at Hoft had uncovered when thinking about, two, uh, about black holes and uh, again being someone's advisor obviously can motivate thinking about certain questions uh, that you hear about when you're uh, you in discussions. Uh, and at the time, uh, at Hoft, uh, Andre had been studying the effect of infalling particles uh, in the neighborhood of a black hole. Uh, and um, since there are gravitational interactions in this, in this uh, the, uh, analysis, what happens is the following, is that an outgoing particle, which could be a Hawking particle, they have actually a rather delicate trajectories because they make it out at some point in time. But if you look at it in the past, uh, relative to the time where they come out, for a very long time, this trajectory is sitting just right outside of the event horizon. 
Uh, and what that means is that anything that falls in has a, a relatively large effect or actually an exponentially large effect on the future trajectory of these particles because just a tiny little shift over here can for example uh, shift this trajectory inside of the black hole horizon uh, and in that case uh, the particle would never make it out. So this arrival time of the particle is exponentially sensitive to any small perturbation at an early time. Uh, and this relationship could be expressed precisely again in terms of a canonical commutation relation between the ingoing uh, uh, position and the outgoing position basically because the outgoing position uh, is uh, shifted by an amount proportional to the <coughs> incoming momentum. So the same canonical commutation relations that I talked about earlier and it also seemed to uh, play a role in this game. Along came ADS-CFT uh, and um, indeed again this question was still on my mind actually in the talk I gave in Strings 2000 uh, where uh, I basically said okay well there are some challenges for holography one of the challenges for holography uh, is indeed to try to find uh, the shock wave interactions uh, in a conformal field theory and, uh, and I said well you have to find them uh, and the identification of this thing within the CFT is a crucial step because you want to uh, understand this from the point of view of uh, resolving uh, a black hole information paradox. Now, um, it took the work of uh, Schenker and Stanford to sort of uh, make me realize that there should be a connection between indeed the ideas that I had developed in conformal field theory and this question. Uh, and I can tell you actually why I didn't immediately realize initially that there was uh, a question that at least uh, an effect in the CFT and the idea that I was doing wrong initially was the following uh, geometrically uh, if you have a shift in ADS space by a certain amount which I knew had to be there because of gravity I thought that from the point of view of the boundary theory in ADS I should not be able to see that shift because basically if I take two parallel trajectories that have are shifted in the bulk by the time I go to the boundary they may actually reach the same point because of the geometry of ADS. Uh, but that was a, a wrong idea because actually it's qu pretty clear this is an ADS black hole. Uh, if I need, would perturb an outgoing particle by an ingoing trajectory, if this trajectory ends up behind the horizon, for sure uh, this trajectory would never reach the boundary. So even from the point of view of the boundary of ADS space, this shockwave interaction really looks gravitational meaning that um, the experiment that uh, Schenker and um, uh, Stanford were doing is the same experiment as that at Hoft and Dre were doing namely imagine that you know already when a signal leaves uh, reach, the, reach the boundary suppose you would know it uh, suppose I now send in another signal by how much does that signal get delayed that's the question that you could ask and that equ question can actually be formulated in terms of what, uh, what I call an exchange algebra uh, where the ingoing signal which is this guy no so this is the outgoing signal this is signal A this is signal B B is the butterfly signal A uh, is going to be disturbed by a small perturbation uh, and the effect of the small perturbation is going to be exponentially enhanced because of the presence mm. of the black hole horizon but uh, that scattering matrix, uh, I want to parameterize it by means of indeed uh, a function. Uh, and since I'm working here in a momentum basis, there's indeed some kind of phase factor that sits here that represents uh, that uh, interaction. But lo and behold, of course, this question uh, that was being asked here is actually the same question that uh, I was uh, talking about earlier. And indeed, uh, the question is what is that phase factor? can be now be analyzed uh, from the point of view of gravity in a way that actually maps to the problem that I just described earlier. Here's again that exchange algebra uh, and the way one would uh, determine that phase factor uh, SAB uh, is by asking the following question uh, this is the hamilton jacobi theory uh, uh, I can have a dual relationship between the energy of a particle and the corresponding time 
uh, and this thing should be the generating function of the appropriate uh, uh, canonical transformation. Uh, and if you think about it a little bit, it should imply these two relationships, that the phase shift uh, is related to the time delay in this particular way. So the task you would have to do is compute the time delay from classical gravity, solve these equations, and determine what this function SAB is. Now, the way that works in the gravity theory is as follows. Is you take a um, spatial section of a black hole. Uh, so the black hole lives uh, in two plus one dimensions in this case, of course, because we're doing ADS3 CFT2. Uh, and this is the horizon of the black hole. This is the interior of the black hole. And that's the exterior. And we're sending in particle A expecting that particle B eventually will come out later. Uh, and indeed, this geodesic length here is going to be an operator that defines the mass of the initial black hole. But then particle A comes in and particle B goes out, and there's a new horizon that now is no longer between A and B, but between B and A. Um, and indeed, there's a canonical transformation between these two variables. Uh, and again, the, the computation we would have to do is to determine the phase space relation between these two things and then compute the corresponding uh, canonical transformation. Uh, and indeed, the answer is th the one we've seen before, where um, if you do this computation in, in semi-classical gravity in two plus one dimensions, you have the same hyperbolic geometry that I was talking about earlier. You have a particular symplectic form you can de derive on the space of spatial metrics, which you can choose to be constant curvature metrics. And again, you find that this um, phase factor I've been talking about is again the volume of a, of a tetrahedron. So, uh, so there was a discussion in conformal field theory. This is the discussion in 2 plus 1 gravity, and the two things actually match. Um, how am I doing with time, actually? <laughs> So maybe yeah, we don't. Can you generalize this result also to higher dimensional ADS? Uh, at this point, I wouldn't immediately know how to do that. Um, so um, the idea, which indeed I, ha I, I had developed in part because of the, the way we had the discussion in um, um, for this boson on a, on a, on a Riemann surface, um, uh, in, in my paper, in 89, I indeed made the suggestion that if you take the geodesic length uh, of, a hyperbolic sur uh, uh, of a hyperbolic metric on a Riemann surface and you act on it on a wave function of your system, that it actually measures the conformal dimension. Uh, and, uh, and in this case, uh, uh, indeed, the canonical transformation between these two things can be extracted from this wild patent symmetric uh, symplectic form. Um, one of the nice things again about coming here is that I heard the talk just before uh, lunch uh, where someone, uh, sorry I forgot your name, but explained that higher, uh, uh, in higher dimensions um, uh, there's an analogous interpretation of conformal blocks as being uh, wave functions of a Hilbert space of some quantum system, in that case it's the Calabria system. So if one wants to do this thing in higher dimensions, uh, the question is, can you indeed determine the, the fusion matrix, which is indeed would then be a canonical transformation uh, between an eigenbasis of two different types of operators? In this case, I was doing it in terms of the geodesic length. Uh, the suggested uh, operator that one should use uh, is potentially the Casimir of the corresponding uh, conformal uh, generators acting on this intermediate channel. By the way, for those of you who it's not clear, uh, I'm writing down here a four-point function. So this is really a four-point conformal block uh, where I have uh, an in-state, an out-state, and two uh, punctures. Uh, and uh, indeed, so this transformation is indeed, uh, again, one of these fusion transformations, except it's slightly different. It's not literally a fusion transformation. It's an R matrix transformation, but these things are, are quite directly related. Um, so, uh, 
the story is more like this. These two are the two heavy states. These are two my, uh, my two light states. This is some intermediate energy. Uh, and then I can ask, okay, well, if I scatter these two particles, two and three, what kind of uh, matrix do I pick up uh, by interchanging their order? Uh, this is the R matrix. Uh, and in 2D CFT, uh, this R matrix is a property of what we call chiral vertex operators. So these conformal blocks are chiral. And I should say that one thing that I lost a lot of time about as well, uh, thinking about these kind of questions, was the following confusion that I had was that uh, this is a property that you get as soon as you look at the left and the right movers independently. But as soon as you put the left and the right movers together of your CFT, then part of the whole point of the conformal bootstrap is to make sure that for Euclidean CFTs, that um, uh, if you interchange operators, the correlation function should not change. You have crossing symmetry. Uh, and therefore, indeed, uh, these, these matrices actually drop out of the non chiral combination where I take the sum of the absolute value of squared on both sides. So if the bulk has non-trivial scattering amplitudes, how can the CFT see them uh, if all those matrices actually drop out of the CFT correlation function? Uh, so I was paying a penalty uh, at this point uh, for spending my time, to, um, uh, too much of my time in Euclidean space. Uh, I studied conformal filtering in Euclidean space uh, but as soon as you go to Minkowski space, uh, these matrices actually uh, show up. Uh, and the reason is the following, is that if you indeed in the, are in the Euclidean regime, the, the conformal bootstrap tells you that these things have to cancel out. But as soon as you go over the light cone, uh, it turns out that for the left movers, this thing goes to its inverse. So notice this epsilon here. That epsilon indeed changes the sign. It's a plus or minus sign as soon as you go over the light cone. Uh, and then literally what you're going to get is indeed what's called an exchange algebra where this braiding matrix actually shows up into uh, the uh, commutation relation for time-like separated operators. Uh, in terms of the current language, what people do is they take this conformal block and they go to something that they call the second sheet uh, where you analytically continue this thing to uh, indeed, uh, go around a uh, two, you move two around three go to a second sheet and then you pick up these uh, matrices. Anyway, uh, so the computation uh, from gravity actually gives the same answer uh, as that you would have gotten by assuming that the boundary CFT was actually Liouville theory. So this raises a question. Um, so it seems that the gravity in the bulk and Liouville theory on the boundary are related. Uh, and that's a, um, a slightly confusing question because there's actually the belief that uh, quantizing gravity in the bulk doesn't make sense. Gravity should be emergent and it should be dual to a CFT. So doing quantum geometry in the bulk is not really the right thing to do, at least according to what people believe. The same is kind of a little bit true for Liouville theory that people tend to put, uh, sort of view Liouville theory not as a really proper uh, CFT because it has a continuum spectrum. Um, and the way in which the bootstrap was solved here was sort of unconventional compared to how people typically want to solve the bootstrap. Typically you want to solve the bootstrap by assuming some kind of discrete spectrum and then sol solving the bootstrap equation with the assumption of a discrete spectrum. So uh, another eye opener for me, at least uh, realizing that these things still are much more closely related is the following is that if you look at the, the works that develop uh, the geometry of these computers or conformal blocks. There's an inner product that you can define on them. And if you recall, I also had an earlier equation where I was writing down uh, the uh, conformal uh, correlation functions as integrals. And these two things are related. This inner product is a delta function, uh, a, a, a direct delta function with a certain prefactor uh, which defines a particular measure uh, and when you uh, write down what the measure actually is, it's expressed in terms of the Plancherel measure of this uh, quantum group. Uh, and it looks in terms of a quantity B related to the central charge, but essentially that it's the square root of the central charge over six. Uh, and this P is related to the conformal dimension as the square root of the conformal dimension. You plug that in, you find that this measure actually precisely measures uh, 
uh, matches with the Cardi formula of the CFT. So uh, this geometry of the conformal blocks knows about the Cardi formula uh, and it knows also by extension about the Bekenstein Hawking formula of the black holes, of the ADF black holes. So, uh, so here's basically the, the, the idea is you take, uh, so according to ADS CFT, you have some kind of large c central charge um, conformal field theory, and there should be some holographic dictionary between that irrational CFT and a string theory in ADS. But there are certain properties of the string theory in ADS that are universal. Uh, when you go to high energy and you go close to a black hole horizon, uh, it's the gravitational interactions that might dominate here. And then the string theory aspect of it is subleading. And if I'm interested in that universal behavior of the 2 plus 1 gravity, um, then it turns out that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the 2 plus 1 gravity and the geometry of this uh, Vera Zorro Liouville conformal blocks. So the, the bootstrap, modular bootstrap, I call it, relates these two things. But this thing is a, an approximation of that. And this thing is an approximation of that. And in which regime are these things approximations? On this side, it's the gravity dominated regime. On that side, it's basically what I call the entropy dominated regime. Uh, where the central charge gets very big and the conformal dimensions of the background uh, are uh, for large uh, compared to C over 12. So this is sort of the physical picture. Uh, let me make a, a one last quick comment. Um, so part of the story of this um, uh, uh, butterfly effect that I mentioned earlier uh, has been uh, receiving quite a bit of attention over the last year. Um, and partly because of an uh, observation of uh, Schenker, Stanford, and Maldesena, is that there might be some kind of universal upper bound on the um, uh, Lyapunov exponent. Uh, so this Lyapunov behavior could be understood directly from the point of view of the gravitational scattering near a black hole horizon. Because of the exponential redshift, there are exponential factors involved. And basically, this thing here is the surface gravity at the uh, horizon of the black hole and it's interpreted as a Lyapunov exponent. Uh, if you want to have a one-line derivation, although it's, it's a slight calculation, but a, a one-line derivation of where this behavior is coming from, this Lyapunov behavior, from the point of view of a CFT, one uh, physical uh, way of getting it is as follows, is that in this re very highly entropic regime that I talked about, where the entropy and the spectrum is very dense, um, you could uh, make the hypothesis that the conformal symmetry is non-linearly realized. And non-linear realized symmetries mean the following, is that you have some kind of Goldstone mode, which is basically the parameter of your transformation, of your symmetry transformation. Uh, and if the stress-energy tensor is parameterized in terms of a symmetry parameter, uh, it looks like this. This is the Schwarzschild derivative. This is some background energy uh, term. So you can think about this maybe as a hydrodynamic parameterization of the stress energy tensor. And now you simply put in the Vera Zorro algebra as a, as a boundary condition on this, uh, on this uh, uh, quantity here. And the fact that this C is a scalar, a, a scalar quantity, it actually prescribes exactly the commutation relations between this uh, operator C. And what you find uh, is that this is the commutation relation, which indeed has an exponential growth in terms of the um, um, time difference between uh, these two operators. So exponentially growing commutators are essentially just a, a consequence in this case of the assumption that the conformal symmetry is nonlinearly realized. Um, so um, to summarize um, the interesting questions that people have been studying over the last year uh, having to do with the dynamics of bulk physics um, from the point of view of ADS-CFT. The bulk physics suggested new things about the conformal field theory and in two dimensions at least those properties can be analyzed quite uh, explicitly simply by analyzing the structure uh, of the infinite conformal symmetry. The question was asked how much of this is being, uh, can be translated to higher dimensions not 
it's not obvious how much can be generalized because the two dimensions in that respect is still quite special. But I would say that uh, some of the questions that people have asked uh, about, okay, how do, what do operators in the neighborhood of horizons, what do they mean from the point of view of the CFT? Can one go in the interior of a black hole from the point of view of a CFT? Those questions are already there present in two plus one dimensions. Uh, let me briefly uh, look back to some of the early um, motivations for this. Um, so when I was studying uh, the literature on uh, yeah, what are the commutation relations that people have derived um, for, from uh, Liouville theory from the point of view of um, uh, yeah, finding these kind of uh, commutators, um, I came across an old paper by um, uh, Fadeyev who um, introduced um, a, a lattice version of um, Liouville theory. This is my last slide. Um, so uh, what Fadeyev uh, did, he, um, and he thought, okay, maybe it's actually useful to have a, a discretized version of, the, uh, of this quantum geometry. And um, uh, the discretized version indeed is interesting because it kind of gives you a more explicit quantum control over the system. Uh, and it's actually a beautiful integrable model. It starts out uh, with uh, a parafermionic type, but this is just standard, not generalized uh, commutation relation between a set of variables that are called Fn. You put them on a chain uh, and this Q, uh, let's assume it's a, uh, a rational phase factor. So these things can be realized as N by N matrices. Turns out that this thing is a discretized version of Liouville geometry if you uh, impose the following equation of motion. So you put these things on a rhombic lattice where basically you zigzag your way through uh, uh, with these integers. And then you can introduce a time step that expresses the value uh, of this quantity uh, at the North Pole, which is the, the, uh, the future, in terms of the quantities uh, in the past through this simple relation. And this turns out to be uh, what's called a, y, a very simple Y system. That's why these variables are called Y. Uh, and integrating this equation actually produces uh, in the continuum limit uh, the Liouville equations. So uh, since some of the motivation of studying um, these kind of systems um, uh, uh, come from this connection with quantum chaos, it's actually an interesting question whether or not this uh, integrable lattice model has essentially Lyapunov behavior. Uh, and the calculation that I had on the previous slide suggests that that's the case. Uh, and um, um, so uh, this is another uh, kind of direction that I'm currently thinking about. Um, so let me finish. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have, uh, yeah, be part of this uh, festive day. I want to also again give uh, Doran my congratulations. Happy birthday, Doran. So, um, so in, uh, whether it's spontaneous or not, um, so if you um, start out uh, with a CFT and you uh, bring it to an excited state and you bring it into a regime where uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of your excited state you have many other uh, energy levels, uh, then it becomes natural to suspect that there is a, a light degree of freedom uh, yeah, uh, and, and the presence of the finite energy density is the thing that then spontaneously breaks the, uh, the conformal <coughs> symmetry. Um, so, um, uh, so the basically the idea is that there's going to be, um, you can call them low energy um, valleys uh, in, 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 in the excitations of the CFT that don't cost much energy uh, and one of those low en energy de uh, deformations is this uh, conformal uh, symmetry parameter. And in two dimensions the infrared problems will not make it massive? Or? 
Uh, yeah, so, so uh, in this case, uh, I wouldn't want to call this spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, in, in the usual sense, in part because the conformal symmetry uh, is you know, sort of in between a local and a global symmetry. Um, but um, uh, so mathematically, um, of course, um, what this parameterization is, I didn't tell, tell you that explicitly, but this parameterization of the stress energy tensor is equivalent to the Liouville parameterization of the, uh, of the stress energy tensor. Uh, and so they, this is simply a reformulation of the earlier intuition that I expressed that when you have a, a very dense energy spectrum that the universal behavior of the CFT will start approaching that of, of Liouville theory. But an, uh, another way of reformulating that is precisely the assumption uh, that the conformal symmetry becomes non-linearly realized. But by the way, uh, Wesson and Witten theories are an, an example of non-linearly realized uh, uh, flavor symmetry, right? So yeah, you have a non-abelian bosonization to dimension is a non-linear non realization of flavor symmetry in two dimensions. That's, that's what bosonization is. Yeah, so the, so the surprising thing that happens is the following is that when you take this exchange algebra that uh, initially if they have both positive uh, energy that after the exchange, the dominant uh, uh, contribution to after exchange algebra could be such that one of the operators gets negative energy, uh, contributes a negative amount of energy. Uh, and I'm, interpret I'm t interpreting <coughs> that part of the exchange algebra as the part of the exchange algebra where one of them is being pushed behind the horizon. So, uh, so the exchange algebra gives you some in insight into what happens near the horizon, but obviously uh, the question of how to construct operators behind the horizon is a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a hairy one. Uh, and this gives you some insight into it, but it's not a complete story.